I'm just kind of chilling. It's good to see everybody. Um, letting everybody kind of jump in. Happy Sunday, Sunday morning. Um, I'm just kind of hanging. Give it a little bit. Grab some coffee. Grab your Bible. Chop it up a little bit. A little bit this morning. Oh, man. I hope everybody had a, a really good week. Rev Canada, love you guys. Good to see you. Um, it's the Canucks. What's up? Uh, hi, guys. Well, bro, I had a wild week. <clears throat> Super awesome. Got to go out to, uh, got to go back to uh, Southern California. Hang out with my, my best bro, <laughs> um, Eric, and we got to go surfing. I don't know how to surf, and he does. And so I said, what's up, Chile? Hi. Um, I don't know how to surf, and he does. And so I was like, yo, you should teach me to surf. <laughs> that didn't that didn't go as well as I hoped it would. It, it went. It was awesome. But um, I got I definitely got, uh, like, washing machine a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> go off the board and then the ocean just decides i know there's only like four feet of water here you 40 year old grown man but i'm gonna legitimately just like put you through the spin cycle and throw you on the ground and so that happened a couple times that was awesome and then uh i'm so i'm was i had no idea how to even navigate the board for those of you guys that have never been surfing it's so cool and it's so wild but i um i was literally just trying to get out over the waves with my board and I jumped to like go over the wave and I <laughs> don't know and the, the wave hit me turned me around and just like made me surf <laughs> it was the Lord it was the Lord bro it was just the Lord was like this is your set Greeno this is the one and because that happened just as like a all right screw it here we go I jumped up and caught the wave and that was cool <laughs> so I still don't know how to I surfed I surfed a couple times I don't know how, but you know, it was a thing. Um, I'm going to say this on the front end, uh, Facebook and Instagram crew, uh, big time shout out to my beloved green sparrow, Chrissy Lee, who just consistently is trying to figure out the best way to set up this upstairs where I'm filming. It looks beautiful. Uh, like my wife, my wife is beautiful. The things she does are beautiful. So she usually makes everything better in my world. <laughs> so <laughs> my chaotic uh, way of being is combined with her, uh, gorgeousness. So big shout out to, um, big humongous shout out to my beloved Green Sparrow for making this upstairs so sick. Um, she's the best. Yeah. So Southern California and then, uh, came back, we did a little bit of, uh, production stuff. Um, cool. I just got to watch and, and, you know, watch cool meetings happen, um, around the movie, uh, that, that we're filming. Um, that I just am so grateful for. Just get the honor to be in a film and do a really cool thing. And so I'm in full on workout mode out here um, with the homies in Salt Lake City. And then on a diet plan and doing all this crazy working out to try to get fit as a leading man. <laughs> and then uh, it's really cool to go out and just see, um, you know, all the stuff that's going on. Uh, on the back end as they're prepping for everything, um, for the, for the film. So that'll be really cool as well. Uh, we're praying. If you can pray with us, if you can believe not just pray for it, but like speak out and really pray for, for, um, all of the perfect people, all of the, the perfect timing and that, uh, that we need miracles. And so it'd be really cool to see miracles. We've seen it. We've just been seeing miracles happen on this movie. So if you can just be in prayer and belief with us, um, I believe, you know, we're, we're believing for, oh, North, hi. <laughs> I must have missed you, bro. Sorry, hi, yes. Yeah, so uh, miracles for the production. Um, right at the beginning of the year that we get to kick a lot of stuff off, um, perfect uh, roles for everybody, back-end stuff, lenses, camera, every, just everything comes together and that it would actually make such a huge impact um that would be really powerful um that's what we're believing for is not just to get it done but to like make a statement and and create um something that lasts something of real value um and something that carries with it 
something deep, you know? So pray for miracles, please, for Dark Arrows, uh, for um, Two Bridges, the production company is putting that on, for all the people involved, um, just for grace and covering. It's crazy, crazy time. So thank you guys for um, sticking with me here. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna do a couple things. I, I, you know, my commitment has sort of changed a little bit on the Sundays. I'm realizing that with the podcast, um, I'm doing interviews and I'm putting a lot out there. This right after lockdown, right at the beginning of Corona camp, this became kind of the primary way that I got a chance to share um, with the podcast going as well. Uh, I'm, I'm realizing that I can, I, I probably need to be a bit more realistic about um, Sundays. And the, the problem is you guys, is that when I first got like saved and really became a follower of Jesus and, and started doing Bible studies, I'm used to leadership in the sense of like, we're all in this together. This is a real community and we're leading and we're on it. And it's like a real thing. And I'm realizing that the internet <laughs> is such a take it or leave it vibe that I feel like it's, it's a, it's just disconnected enough that people can take it serious if they want, but if they don't want to, they just get a chance to kind of brush up against it. And so the reality of the situation is if I want to have, if I want to say something powerful for people, if I really want to be a strong encouragement and more than anything, if I want people to come across this and recognize and see that there are people in, in the world and people like you and me that are really proud, um, of Jesus, like really proud of him, like proud to be loved by him. Um, not proud of, uh, evangelicalism, not, not proud of our theology, not proud of the right or the left, not proud of the political spectrum of beliefs, not proud of our national identity, not proud of any flag, not proud of anything else, but I am proud of, uh, Jesus. I'm so proud of him and I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for him. And in the midst of all of the different ways that Christianity can be skewered and sold off to the highest bidder. There, there is a remnant of people all over the planet that are just in love with that man. And uh, to love something sometimes is enough. <clears throat> uh, so what I'm realizing is I want people to bump into this in an online format. And the reality is I'm not your, I'm not your pastor, right? Like I'm used to like, well, if you lead the Bible study, <laughs> it's like a so I want this kind of have a feel of like, Hey, we're doing a little Bible study on a Sunday, but I also want you guys to know it's like, you guys got a lot going on and it's busy. So I'm saying all those things to say, I'm, I'm tightening up the timeline on the Sunday mornings together because my tendency is just to share. Cause I'm so excited to share. Um, but you know, the reality of the situation is if I can pack up, if I can pack it down into a shorter period of time, it's probably going to be a better use for you guys. You might have more to chew on and think about. Um, you might not feel weird about dipping out because um, people are going to come and go. So what I wanted to do is I want to, I want to stay with where we were in Matthew 13. Overarching, I started, uh, I had this sense that there was wisdom, there was wisdom about the political nature of what America was going through in the book of Daniel. And so I started in Daniel and we've been in Daniel and I got to Daniel chapter four, which is the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar part two. It's the second dream he had. It's the humbling of a massive world leader. It's, it's the, it's the reality of being checked by the creator of the universe when you think you are God. Um, and it's also to me an invitation to look out for the poor. So Daniel chapter four is really powerful, but I just haven't felt super like, yeah, let's stay in Daniel right now. Um, we did the Rev weekend for all of the, the leaders and, and people in our community. Um, and so on the heels of that, we, I started, I just wanted to unpack what we landed on at the Rev weekend and give everyone a chance to kind of like catch up with us because um, wherever you are, if you need an extended form of community or tribe or people that are going to encourage you to stay connected to Christ in the middle of all these things that are shifting and changing and good, some things that just need to change. Um, and in that, as we change, it's easy to let go of what you've had. And even if you're not sure what's coming and what I want is to create the space for all of us to say everything about my Christianity can change. Everything about my life can change 
in an instant and has. The whole world is just like locked down. What is going on? Everything in our world can change in an instant. There's very little uh, sense of certainty and security for a lot of people right now. There's a lot of people that just need to be able to have the spiritual gift of, I don't know, and I'm really scared. That is a real thing. People need to have space to do that. And what I'm trying to create is the, the room in all of our lives for us to acknowledge the fact that my Christianity, my version of Jesus, my understanding of what this thing is could be really deficient, really bad, actually aiding and abetting injustice in the world. And that might not have anything to do with Jesus. That might have everything to do with the system. Jesus stands above it. He also is like in the midst of it, jacking us up and working this thing out because he wants, I believe, love without hypocrisy on the inside of us. That's across the board. So because being an American hardcore kid, I usually have that mindset, that worldview. But I'm going to say as an American male hardcore kid from the subculture here, doing my best to try to understand and not understanding at the same time, I would just like to say that Jesus is messing my world up and I want to let go of him, but that's not actually the invitation. The invitation is to let go of everything I, I think is him so that I can find him and he can find me again, that it's okay to let go of what was. It's okay to put certain things back on the table and go, this has nothing to do with who I want to be and allow Jesus to show up in your world. You don't have to stop pursuing Christ even if you let go of what feels like everything about your Christianity. There's a lot of people in that transition and the political nature of what the American church is selling out for, the, uh, the political nature of what those in uh, let, let's um, disenfranchised and, and, uh, and historically uh, maybe like have not uh, communities in America, they've got stuff to say. Everyone's got stuff to say and there's so much value in a season like right now where wrongs can be righted, where injustices can be addressed because they're not on the timeline of the powerful, they're on the timeline of the people on the bottom. It is a Matthew 25, 40 kind of time. And if the people that have the keys don't stop and listen to the people that are actually feeling locked up, we're gonna be in some trouble. But Jesus invites us to lay our life down, our power down, our privilege down, our assignment down, and look at the people that we don't want to look at. Who is your neighbor? Who's the neighbor? Who's the one that when they're beat up and left on the side of the road, who are you going to step around and who's actually going to stop and pick them up and put them on the donkey and take them to the inn and pay for them? Who's your neighbor? This is a really powerful time for us to re-examine what really our Christianity is. And there's so many people that I can see and feel and hear and talk to that because their Christianity was, was almost like rooted in a smaller version of who they were, it was automatically rooted in an inferior version of who Christ is. And as they let go of one, they feel like they have to let go of the other. If I grow and I feel like I get bigger than Jesus, do I have to stay with this dude? Or is this dude just some archaic belief of control and manipulation and uh, homophobia and racism? And, and it's all just this gross power structure that's totally up for the highest bidder. And I don't want anything to do with it. And I believe that Jesus is like, and I say this all the time, I just feel like we're, we're in this box arguing about all this garbage that has really nothing to do with the character and nature of Christ. Meanwhile, the Holy Spirit is like outside of the building on the sidewalk, just having a cigarette. Like, are they, are they done in there? Are they going to come out here and meet me? Or are they just going to stay in their box and kick each other in the balls for the next 10 years because it's not working? So what I want to submit to you guys is I really believe that where we're at is, is powerful and important. I believe it's possible to let go of and shed small versions of yourself in Christ, small versions of your Christianity in Christ, small versions, horrible versions of whatever the followers of Jesus represent to you and not let go of the hand of the Lord who's leading you through your journey specifically. All of us are from different places, different points of view. I'm not asking people to violate their conscience. I'm not at, well, maybe I am. I don't know. I don't know if in the parable of the Good Samaritan, if the man who was on his way somewhere else, right, the, the, the Hebrew Jewish man that was on his way somewhere else and saw a Samaritan get like 
rolled up on. I don't know if he really in his conscience wanted to stop, but Jesus in the story says, who's your neighbor? It's your enemy beat up, hurting, left alone, ignored, not listened to. You are not like them. Help them. That's your neighbor. So I, maybe I do want to insult our consciences a little bit. Maybe we're just a little too comfortable in our co conscientiousness. Maybe Jesus's subversive, messed up way is going to cause all of us to stop being so selfish and actually look at people and listen to people that we don't want to listen to. Let God be true and let every man be a liar, including you, including me. Like, let Jesus be Jesus, man. He'll mess this whole thing up and it'll be great, okay? Maybe, I don't know, if we'll let him. My feeling is we're all in this weird time. We're all scared. <laughs> There's so much fear in the atmosphere. It's nuts. There's so much uncertainty. And for some of us, we've had the best year that we've ever had. Like I got plenty of friends, plenty of people that are like, dude, 2020, I know it was like a nightmare, but it was awesome. Like it was great. Some people feel like, yo, this is sick. You know, stuff that we never would have talked about before is fine. We have to talk about it now. This is great. Like it can be a problem. It can be an opportunity depending on your viewpoint. But what I want to submit to you guys is in uh, Matthew 13, what I, what I saw when we were going through it was uh, the idea that it's okay to give it a name. What I'm seeing and what I'm sensing is rooted in connection. My worldview, my, a, a strong part of my theological identity as a Christian is that I am engaged to Jesus. I am the bride of Christ. I, I, with the rest of the body of Christ, am characterized in the word of God as like the bride of the Christ. And so there's a union that comes. There's a marriage day that's coming. There's, there's a day in my future where there will be perfect union. But right now, my heart is to be committed fully to him. And so if we're talking relationship, and if we're putting it in a context that I understand, like marriage, like a relationship, what, what we are learning, what Chrissy and I are learning from our marriage uh, counselors, from our connection coach, from our um, uh, sexologist in our relationship, is that um, interesting theory, interesting data, there's science for it. When one partner gets educated two to four years more than the other partner, like if, if I just go to college and Chrissy doesn't, let's say, and I get two to four years of education, there, there's a potential gap that widens between Chrissy and I to the point where 70% of relationships will end in divorce and one of the contributing factors is that they grew apart. Like that's a real thing that's happening. So that's just education. That's just if I go to school, if I go to college and I get educated or Chrissy goes to school and she gets educated and she gets two to four years of education more than me, there's a very high chance that if we don't maintain healthy connection, we're gone just because she has changed so much in her understanding just on an educational level. What if one of the partners grows two to four years in self-awareness, humility, understanding, and the other partner is still sort of like not? It's possible to grow apart. It's possible. That's what I'd like to submit to you guys. What I feel like I'm hearing is in this spiritual marriage, right? This is a great mystery, right, is what Paul says, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. When he talks about marriage, that's what he's saying. When I talk, I'm talking about, I'm giving you guys this mystery. I'm talking about Christ and the church, right? So Jesus and the church is like a marriage. And what I'm seeing is there's a lot of people. Th there's a BS celebrity culture in, in our sort of stream of Christianity, which makes pastors and like speakers and stuff like that, like these quasi celebrities. And I've heard it said that the church needs to, to just be fascinated with the bridegroom, Jesus, and they need to stop being fascinated with the best man, who's the preacher on stage. We got to get that crap out of our heads. This is unbelievable to me that you could make a celebrity star out of some nerd that got saved by the king and you're ignoring the king. Blows my mind. I'm also a hardcore kid and I've seen dudes in bands that everyone looks up to get knocked out. So maybe my worldview says you're not that cool if you're on stage. I don't mind that worldview. I'm not that cool. 
No one on stage is that cool. They're a nerd. They're a human. If they're a Christian on stage, they were so dumb and they made such a mess of their life that they needed Jesus to save them. All honor, all grace, all glory to the king, not to that nerd on stage. Are you serious? I'm engaged to the guy behind the guy. I don't care about that guy. And neither should you. Neither should we. We've made a mockery of the platform that God has given to people so they can herald his return. It's wild. So we got to get our eyes off the best man. We got to get our eyes back on the bridegroom. You are engaged to the king of all kings who has such radical affection for you. It will blow your mind if we can get a hold of it. So is it possible to outgrow one another? I think that's what I'm hearing from people. Most of the people in my life, I feel like everyone is really like, it's few and far between. Honestly, the people that I feel like are like, I feel so much closer to Jesus right now. I feel super connected. I feel like it's it's very personal what's going on for people. And there's a lot of people in my world that I feel like they are struggling to find out what they really believe about him right now, who he really is to them. And I would say a big part of that is because they're all growing. So if your Christianity is almost antithetical If it's a problem for you as a Christian to grow emotionally, to grow physically, to grow financially, to grow socially, to grow sexually, if it's impossible for you, if it's a hindrance to your Christianity, like your Christianity says, don't become a more full human, man, that's a problem. That's a wild problem to have, I would imagine. Seems that way. I can't, I don't even get to explore who I am in this kingdom because there's this rule that says I don't get to. I would like to ask you who gave you that rule. I don't think it was Christ. I don't think Jesus is scared of our freedom. I think he gave it to us. I think he gave us life to live it. I think it's a great gift. But I think religion does a thing. Cultural religion does a thing. Cultural Christianity can do a thing where you're not allowed to fully develop who you are So you live in a constant fear or battle with who you're not allowed to be. And so all of a sudden we're sin focused instead of freedom focused. And it's a a huge problem. Matthew 13. Gee whiz. I just wanted to riff a little bit, but I'll get us there. Okay. We got like, I got like eight minutes. I'm at 22 minutes on this day. So I'm going to do this in eight minutes and then maybe we'll have some time to think about it. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seeds. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. It went away when the wheat sprouted and formed heads. Then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. There's a few things in this. One of which is there's people that I know that are dear to me in my life that, um, that have... There's people on both sides of very significant issues. The issue for them is seen in different ways. It's a, it's a jewel with a bunch of different facets. So when you're talking about systemic racism, when you're talking about issues of poverty, when you're talking about issues of government control, when you're talking about issues of freedom and family, when you're talking about financial decisions that can affect the lives of millions, when we're talking about taxation and government and representation and all these things, there's a, there's a multitude of ways to look at them. And the minute too many of us get too black and white creates a lot of problems for people. Now, there's also certain things that are just like right and wrong for people. So just understand, I've got friends and family, all of whom I care about dearly, that are on different sides of a multitude of issues, and none of them want to be wrong. None of them are willing to be wrong. Like, it's interesting to watch. But what I wanted to submit to you guys and what we started doing last week was, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed 
good seed in his field. Original intent. Right? The kingdom of heaven is within you. The kingdom of heaven is like there's good seed that was sown. And then in the midst of that good seed, what it says is when everyone fell asleep, an enemy came and sowed bad seed. Now, the way Jesus goes on to, to interpret this is to say there's people that are under the influence, under the influence of the good seed. And there's people that are under the influence of the enemy's seed. So we can understand it because all of us have been prideful, arrogant, angry, greedy, perverted, corrupt, impatient, unkind, not gentle, whatever these things are out of control. All of us have experienced what we talked about last week, which was harmatia, har 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 the idea that I've got the arrow pulled and I let it go and it just does not hit the target. I'm in sin. I just, I'm do, trying to do the right thing and the wrong thing keeps happening. All of us have had seasons like that. All of us knows what, what it's like to be in a season where it feels like nothing is going right even when I try my best. That is, to me, a very clear personal like uh, view of being able to understand what it's like to be in sin. The power of sin. Why does it feel corrupt? Why does it feel so bad? Why doesn't it seem to work? What, why do I feel so messed up? There's, there's seeds that are not faith and not hope and not love that are sown in the spirit and they, they result in things in the natural. And so what he's talking about is you can be under the influence of love. You can be under the influence of fear. I've seen people do both, right? And so what he says is in the field, he sowed good seed. Then when everyone was resting, everyone was sleeping, an enemy came and then messed it up and then dipped. And that's what's been interesting to me is that I have gone through a season specifically where there's been death and death and death and death and death and death. And I've prayed life and 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 life. And it feels like this accusation. The owner's servants came to him and said, didn't you sow good seed? Where did the weeds come from? Isn't this supposed to be good? Where's the bat? What, is this on you? And then he basically says, I get what you're asking me. And so when you're in pain or you're pissed or you're hurting or you feel like you're praying to the God of life to like save lives and people keep dying in your life, that's a really confusing place to be. For Chrissy and me, we just kept feeling like we're not making you up here, God. We prayed to you like we thought you wanted us to and everyone we pray for to stay alive seems to die. Can you please tell me what's happening here? Is this on you? And if the enemy comes back, or if, if the answer comes back, no, the seeds of death and destruction and perversion and corruption, these are seeds that are the effect of sin. That's not seeds I've sown in your life. That's not seeds I've sown in this world. An enemy did this. Like, this is not from me. That's a hard answer to hear. Because he's the only dude in the room. Again, the enemy messes it up and then dips. So the only one that sticks around and is accountable to be yelled at is God. And that's because he loves us. But like, is actually invested in us. Actually will never leave us. So the only one that's accountable to hear from us, we blame when stuff sucks. I think he understands that. I think he's like, yeah, I get that. That's the game for sure. And I, because I understand the rules, this is what I want to submit to you. Second Peter 3. And this is kind of where I'll end it. I want you guys to think about this because it's actually super important. Um, it says, do not forget this one thing. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now remember, repentance is a changing of your thought, a changing of your mind that results in a change in your direction. All of us repent all the time. When you have a change of mind about a thing, and it results in you change. Like, I'm spending too much money. 
I can't spend this much money anymore. I need to get on a budget. Crink, that was repentance. I can't eat like this. I can't stay up this late and make it to work on time. I can't treat people in my life like this and have them around. I shouldn't do this because bad, th like that's repentance. That's repentance goes boom, boom, boom. The Lord is not slow. We like want him to hurry up and do all of the work right now. But then in this parable, in Matthew 13, they say, there's, there's bad seeds in the garden. He's like, yeah, the enemy did that. And they go, should we pull it up right now? And he says, no, again, he's patient. He's like, listen, I'm doing good seeds in you. Bad things might be happening. Bad things might be taking place in your life too. If you try to judge and uproot all the bad, there's a good chance you could uproot some of the perseverance, some of the faith, some of the overcoming, some of the wisdom, some of the understanding, and most importantly, the love that's developing in you from me. Be patient. And so I just feel like in a time where there is just almost universal judgment wars, boom, like everyone's trying to judge each other out of wherever we are. Everyone's just going off like, this is wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong. And like, listen, I, I've got my own convictions about these things. I, I'm, I'm told, I totally hear you. Do you want us to go and pull them up? And Jesus says, no, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. If we go super hard in our judgments, we might uproot the very good things that are actually happening at the same time. So that's where I say, it's possible, like the, the Bible has a verse that says, be angry, sin not. Is it possible to actually let your anger drive you for change without turning the anger into sinful rage towards your enemy, uh, judgment and, and arrogance against someone else, pride and ego of your strength versus their weakness? Whatever your position is, it's possible to have the anger, the emotion of anger driving you in a positive way, not into a negative or destructive way. It's possible to be angry and not be in sin. What I see is everyone seems to be scared, hurting, pissed, judgment everywhere. Just bah, 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 bah. It's like a judgment war. And I just want to let you know, we as humans are super bad at making just judgments when power is involved. We are a mess. So I just want to submit to you guys on my list, my wheat and tares. Remember I said, make a list of all the good things that God has done. So you don't bail on Jesus because everything seems to suck. Sure. Everything can seem to suck. That has nothing to do with all of the beautiful things that are God happening in your life. And there's, there's seeds of the enemy for me, um, the, the, the racism in America, the fear, the materialism, the consumerism, the, the perversion of kind of the word of God or preaching the word of God for profit is what it feels like. Like there's so many things on the, le on the right side, the tears. And those are things that could be in me. So I'm going to start there and then I'm going to look out at the world around me. But the reality is like, there's real problems to me. There's stuff that has literally caused me to question my faith in all of it and wanted to leave. I get it. And where I need to like bring this in for a landing is that behind all of it, behind all of it, when I look at this parable, I go like, you've been sowing good seeds in me. When I didn't, I didn't even know. The Song of Solomon has a verse in it, you know, which is, which is a love song. It's like his left hand is under my head, his right arm embraces me. So there's times where I can see his embrace and his left arm is back here and I, I don't know what he's doing. That's always been a part of my journey with him. I just don't like feeling confused or scared. Like I don't know what he's doing sometimes. And there's a lot of, I don't know what you're doing right now. And that makes me want to leave. <laughs> like, no, I want to go somewhere else. It's possible for me to outgrow, grow apart from the very thing that I am I'm so proud of. And so what I want to submit to you guys is it's possible in this searching time to make the list of the seeds of the enemy that you don't want any part of in you. You don't want any part of in the community. 
please make a list of all the good seeds that he's sowing in you so that you can stay focused on what he is doing in you and what he is doing in the world. And we can actually be a force for transformation into the next generation of our history. We have a hidden history in the church and it's not mainstream. It's not pop culture. It's really not. And we have a chance to redefine and transform our whole culture in one generation. We have a chance to do that. Boom. But it's going to take us really taking stock of what are we going to put up with and what are we not going to put up with? What are we going to be about and what are we not going to be about? I'm not going to be about these things. I get them. I will address them. We keep them out. I'm going to be about these things. Who do you want to be? And the way you get to do that is you get to decide what is your value system and what is Jesus doing in you? What are the seeds that he's sown in you? That's where we stay. The good seeds that he's been sowing. And we don't blame him for the bad seeds that the enemy is sowing. But what we do is we say, yeah, and if we recognize that, that has no part of our garden, has no part of the, the field of God. So he sees it, man. He's, he's, not, he's not not paying attention. But my, my hope would be that there's a generation of us that feel like Christians are really good at playing church, but they suck at life. And so we've tried to get better at living life. And it feels like we've gotten worse at being Christians. <laughs> and I don't even mind because I just feel like we're in transformation. Can't help you. I'd rather be really good at life and actually connected to Christ in a version of Christianity that I don't even understand right now. I'd rather have that than play this like church box game that feels so full of hypocrisy and garbage. I don't want it. I don't want to support it. I don't want to be a part of it. Unfortunately, I can't get away from Jesus and I can't get away from his people. I can't. We are connected. Same father, same spirit, same future in all of us. I can't get away from the very people that are driving me bananas right now. And I can't get away from some of the people that I feel like without realizing it are playing into a system of such corruption that it's hurting millions of people all over the world, right? Bad seed. Same time, the gospel of Jesus, the wounds of Christ are healing billions of people all over the world. Which one do I want to be about? That's my question for you. That's my question for me. So Matthew 13, love school today, continuation. There's good seed and there's bad seed. And if we don't give it a name, we don't actually take stock. We're going to live in this weird cloud of like, well, I want to be a Christian, but I mostly hate it. That's not a way to move forward. Fully empowered, that's not a way to move forward fully connected. I want you to focus on what Jesus is doing in your life today. I want you to focus on what Jesus is doing in the world today. And let's develop and strengthen that culture and that way, when the counterfeit shows up, we aren't even paying attention. It, it has no sway over us at all. We are so familiar with the good things that God is doing that when these corrupt influences, power, greed, and ego, and hatred, and fear, when they show up, we go, God, that's not even real. You don't get to come in here. And it's very easy for us to make the like, that's not, that's not a part of our culture. And hopefully, 20 years from now, the world around us will go, yeah, like they, they just stopped playing. They like quit playing games. It was like love over everything for these guys. And they will love and serve all of the people that they meet. They don't, they don't distinguish who's the good people or the bad people. They just treat people like Jesus would have treated them, right? Which is the law. The law of Christ that we're supposed to live under is love one another like he loves you. Not like I love you, not like you love me. Love one another like he loves you. That's the standard. If we don't get there, we're blowing it. And that's what I want to focus on. I want to become so full of that kind of love that I stop being so pissed at all these people in my world. I just, I'm so tired of being pissed off. I'm just so tired of it. So it's my sermon to myself as well. Love you guys. So Matthew 13 today, we gave it a name. We're giving it a name, okay? There's good seed and there's bad seed, right? We can focus on the bad seed, which is happening all over the world. We can try to uproot all the bad seed. And while we do that, we're going to uproot the faith and the hope and the love and the perseverance and the patience and the kindness that Jesus is sowing in the same field. So he's like, be patient. Let God be the judge of the injustice. Our work is in here 
creating that culture of celebrating what is Jesus so that we can look at everything that's not from him and say, you don't belong in the field. And there's coming a day when the fiery love of God is going to burn all that away. Only love is going to stand at the end, you guys. So we have a chance. So anyways, that's my second part, Matthew 13. I'll try to get back into Daniel 4. But to be honest with you guys, I've been pretty fascinated the last couple of days with the sacred wounds of Christ. And so I might just look at those for a minute and we'll get back into Daniel 4. Um, saying prayer words for you guys. I love you all a lot. Um, and I hope that you guys are doing really good. Uh, Matthew 13, 2 Peter 3, 9. Yeah, I don't know. Anyways, hope that was cool. Uh, ch check out, we've got three podcast episodes coming up this week. That should be pretty cool. Um, say pray words for the film. Um, oh, oh, big announcement. Sorry. November 9th. We're doing a, uh, me and Chrissy Green and, a, and uh, our homies, Sean and Michelle uh, Gaby and uh, friends from all over. We're hosting another uh, marriage connection sex uh, seminar with uh, uh, Glenn, Dr. Glenn and Phyllis Hill. And they're going to be hosting it uh, for the connection codes. And so I just want to let you guys know, uh, I really truly believe this. And I'm saying this, I believe that they have what could be almost like the new version of the five love languages for our generation. I think they've got a tool that they've developed over almost 40 years. I think they've developed a tool to help people communicate and connect and actually strengthen relationships, like as people, not just in marriage, but like as humans. And so I'm believing that they are actually going to be like, the, the connection codes is actually going to be a really powerful way for people to share and connect. If you are, are experiencing disconnection in your friendships, if talking to people is really hard for you right now, if you don't know how to maintain connection when stuff is not going well, if you feel like you're just sucking at humaning, I'm telling you guys, learning the tools of the connection codes with Dr. Glenn and Phyllis Hill is going to change your life. I swear to you, okay? Like there is a, yeah, so we're doing a podcast November 9th. I believe it's like four to six weeks it's, it's, and, and so I'm telling you guys, if you're married, if you want to be married, if you like the way, if you can spell marriage, you should get on this thing because it's awesome. Okay. I, I honestly believe that learning this tool has helped Chrissy and I stay alive in the last couple of years. We have so much affection for one another. We have a deep sense of like tenderness and love for each other. And we were so buried by some of the BS that we had to walk through that I don't know if we would have known how to really stay connected. I think we would have done our best, but I think we would have maybe done more harm than good. And so I'm telling you guys, this is a powerful time coming up. I'm going to keep promoting it. Um, my goal is to get as many people that need help. If you've got a couple that is right on the edge of divorce right now, if you've got a couple that's struggling um, relationally, struggling sexually, they don't know how to connect the spark is gone, whatever that, you know, there's been an affair, like serious stuff. That's what these guys deal with is like, they help people reconnect based on the science of connection, how our brain responds to each other. Powerful stuff. So the connection codes, real deal, real deal. I am believing that I will see in an airport, the connection codes book in like the next five years. And it'll be like a crazy bestseller. And everyone will be like, Oh my God, we get to be a part of it at the jump. It's going to be awesome. Anyways. <sighs> All right. Here's my commercial. Really, I just think it's dope. It's so dope. And um, for the Rev kids, it's like, I'm just, <clears throat> I, I'm really, I'm really believing that the language of the connection codes is going to become a bigger part of our later, our leadership language with one another, especially because there's so many relationships over the past four or five years that I feel like have gone sideways or there's been weird like bumps in the road. And because we're all over the world, all over the country, it's very easy to misunderstand and lose connection with one another. So my hope is that by using the connection codes, even in our leadership culture, that we will be able to maintain deep connection with one another, especially when stuff is a little weird. Um, so if you're a leader, if you want to be a leader, if you're a human, if you want to be married, if you want to have a hot marriage, if you want to be like super sexy with your partner um, and you're in that like beautiful space, please check these dudes out. Please jump on this uh, thing with us. Um, it all starts with how we connect with the emotion and the science of connection. And so if we don't know how to strengthen that, we're going to be in trouble, especially in 
kind of a disconnected time like this. So uh, the Connection Codes uh, uh, seminar coming up November 9th, and you can do it online. It's all on Zoom. We'll all be on Zoom calls together, and there's uh, practical work, and there's all sorts of stuff. Super duper awesome. If you just met with them one-on-one -on -one for the weeks and weeks and weeks, it probably cost you like thousands of dollars, honestly, and I want to say it's like less than 100 bucks. It might be like 60 or so. I can't remember. I'll ask Christy Green. But it's like, it's just one time you get access and understanding of stuff that would normally cost so much money. It's so sick. So please jump on that with us. I was going to do that at the beginning. I totally spaced it. Please let people know that there's a conference or a marriage thing coming up and it's real deal. Like it's not, it's not, it's not always PG either. It's like for real deal. Like this is serious stuff. So love you guys a lot. Um, if you have questions or anything, any prayer, uh, you can send us prayer requests either online here or at uh, the rev gatherings at gmail.com. Um, rev talks podcast coming out this week. Uh, I think that's it, man. I like you guys a lot. Um, praying for you all. Okay. Bye.